Thank you for joining me for worship today. Today is the second Sunday in Advent, a season of preparing for Christmas and also preparing for the Lord's return on the last day. Our order of service will use parts of the service of word and sacrament that begin on page 26. And we'll begin right now with hymn number 12, Hark the glad sound, the Savior come. come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of the works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in You did 
epistle reading for this second Sunday in Advent is from Romans chapter 15, verses 4 to 13, where the Apostle Paul talks about or encourages peace and unity among us who by the grace of God believe in Jesus our Savior. Paul wrote, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. All mankind will see God's salvation. Alleluia. chapter 3 verses 1 to 12 a reading in which we hear about John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is near this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah a voice of one calling in the desert prepare the way for the Lord make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
Let's sing our next hymn, hymn number 47, Behold, a Branch is Growing. this second Sunday in Advent is our Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 10. Isaiah writes, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be 
glorious. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear fellow subjects of Christ our King, Queen Victoria of England had a habit that she would like to sometimes leave the palace and and leave the royal throne and go out amongst the people a little bit in her common clothes, go out incognito. And on one occasion, what she did is she slipped out a side gate and, well, she went out and she had her faithful servant, John Brown, with her, following behind her a bit. But as she was out walking, she happened upon this flock of sheep that were being driven by this young boy. And when the young boy saw her, he said, um, keep out of the way, stupid old woman. Well, Queen Victoria didn't really say anything. And she just kept walking on. But then her faithful servant, John Brown, did speak to the lad and did tell him who he had spoken so disrespectfully to. And the young lad said, um, but she should dress like a queen then. And you can just imagine how he might have, must have felt. Because Jesus came into our world and didn't come into our world, oh, he didn't go to the royal palace and assume residence there. He didn't seek the patronage of the Jewish leaders when he began his ministry. And what he did instead is he humbled himself. He set aside the full glory that was his as the true Son of God he humbled himself in order to be our Savior. And because of that, well, there were those who did recognize him as the Savior, but so many, they didn't recognize him as Christ the King. So many people, they looked at him, and still today, so many people look at him, and because of what he did, how he lived his life and everything, they think of him as a stupid young man who never amounted to much in this life because he was crucified. Because he was crucified before he could, in their eyes, accomplish anything, really. Of course, these people are looking at things in earthly terms instead of looking at things in a spiritual, eternal terms sort of a way the way in which, well, thankfully, we are able to picture Christ our Savior. Well, today, what we want to do is we want to look at what the prophet Isaiah says about our Advent King coming to us. Our Advent King comes to us, and we'll see that he comes to us through, from an unlikely source, but he comes to us admirably equipped, and he comes to us to establish a righteous kingdom. The prophet Isaiah, he was inspired to write these words at a time when international wars threatened the security of the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Isaiah, he had warned, well, think first off the, the northern kingdom. He warned them about the Assyrian Empire coming in and, and causing them grief, destroying them basically because of their rebellion against God. And, well, the southern kingdom of Judah, they too had rebelled against God. But but Isaiah was able to say to them that they didn't really need to fear the Assyrians despite the fact that they were 
looking at the Assyrians and saying, oh, they're going to flatten us. They're going to destroy us. But the Lord boldly proclaimed to them, O oh, my people who live in Zion, thinking of the southern kingdom, O oh, my people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians. And what the Lord would do is he would deliver Judah from the Assyrians. They wouldn't be destroyed by the Assyrians. However, what God did also allow Isaiah to do is to peer further into the future just beyond what happened with the Assyrians. And, well, over a hundred years later, what would end up happening is that, well, the, Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah would fall. What would happen is that, oh, they would sin against God. They would rebel and they would experience that judgment from God, the Babylonian exile, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But then in, they'd return in repentance to the Lord and the Lord would forgive them. And what the Lord also through Isaiah warned the people is not to trust in foreign alliances, but to trust in the Lord to trust in the Lord. But they ignored the warnings that the Lord gave through the prophet Isaiah, as well as his promises of forgiveness. They ignored those words, and so the royal house of David would be cut down, as it's pictured here in this reading. It would be cut down, uh, the glorious tree of David's dynasty, as it's pictured here, would be cut, cut down so that it would just be a lowly stump, nothing but a stump. And despite God's judgment and the people's unworthiness, though, what Isaiah wanted the people to know is the Lord remained faithful, the Lord would remain faithful to his promises, and so he called on them to to turn to and to look to their faithful God, where they would find salvation and rescue from the problems that they caused themselves. And likewise, what we can say is that when we sin against God, when we rebel against God, isn't it wonderful for us to always know about our God's faithfulness, our God's great desire to be gracious and merciful to us, how he wants to forgive us and and how as believing children of God, we can rest assured that he's going to help us out of the problems and the troubles that we cause ourselves in this life. Well, Isaiah said, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. God had sent his judgment on the people of Judah and the house of David and, well, that glorious tree of David's dynasty was, was nothing but a stump. It was Jesse's stump, it's called here. And, well, Jesse, that's King David's father, of course. But what God was going to do is God was going to send his son. God was going to send Jesus. But to see how low David's dynasty had gone, had gotten, well, just think of what happened when Mary and Joseph, both of them descendants of David, that means they were part of the royal family. But yet when they went to Bethlehem, when Jesus was about to be born, the only place that they could find for him in which to be born was that barn in Bethlehem. When Jesus came from the house of David. We can see, though, that God not only knows how to, well, chop down, well, the dynasty of David, the Jewish people, but he also knows how to generate renewed life in dying wood from an unlikely source. From an unlikely source, what God does is God brings life out of death. And now, from the fallen people of Judah, God raised up Jesus. 
And now that's absolutely wonderful. That's absolutely great news for us because, well, the Apostle Paul says, God who is rich in mercy made us spiritually alive when with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. From the dead stump of Jesse, God raised up Jesus to bear fruit, to become the Savior, to do such wonderful things for, the, for those people, for the people of the Jews, and also for us today as well. And remember what we were. We were also dead spiritual stumps, but God raised us up. God raised us up and made us his children. Oh, once a large, beautiful piece of marble was taken to Canova, an Italian sculptor from, oh, about 250 years ago, a little bit, maybe more than that. And that, that marble was taken to him so that he could sculpt a statue of Napoleon. However, as he looked at that slab of marble, what happened is that he noticed this slight red mark that, tri that went through the block. And when he saw that, well, he saw it. To the untrained eye, you'd probably never notice it, of course. But Canova said, I cannot work with this. It has a flaw. It is not perfectly pure and white. I will not lay my chisel upon it. And now, I tell you that story because think of the imperfections and the, the faults that the omniscient eye of God can see in you and me, in Isaiah, in the people of the Jews. Yet he does not reject us because of our sins. The Apostle Paul says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And through his word, he's worked on our hearts to make us members of his believing family. Isaiah said of Jesus, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Oh, when we think of the spirit of the Lord descending on Jesus, we think of what happened when the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came on Jesus, lighted on him, it says, when he was being, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, when he was being installed into his office as our promised Savior, promised Messiah, as he was beginning his ministry. And the Spirit's gift that are mentioned here tell us how admirably equipped our Savior was to do his work. He was given the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and that means he knows how to deal with the problems of daily living so that everything in our lives can work together for our eternal good. He also had the spirit of counsel, and that means that he has the gift of being able to make plans for, our, for us and our lives, plans for us and our lives that'll work, that'll guide and lead us to our eternal home, he has the spirit of power, which means, of course, that there, think about it. He has the power to help us through anything. He has the power to help us through anything. And there's never a situation that we could ever be in that he could, doesn't have the power to be able to handle. And then he has the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And when you put those two terms together, well, that he has the spirit of knowledge, that means that he, well, he knows the will of God. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord means that he has this proper awe and respect for God and for his plan of salvation that led the Savior to say, 
I always do what pleases the Father. And what pleases God the Father, that's ultimately the salvation of souls, bringing more and more people into God's believing family. And that's what Jesus is always working for. Isaiah says, Jesus will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. See now Jesus, again we say he's admirably equipped to be our king and our judge. Imagine if Jesus were only able to judge us on the basis of our deeds. If he did that and he just looked at our deeds, he'd see that we'd sinned and that we deserve God's wrath and punishment, that we've fallen short of the glory of God, that we deserve eternal punishment, and that'd be the only thing that he could do. But remember what Jesus can do. He can look into our hearts. He can see that although we are spiritually poor and needy, he can see that through the faith, the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts while well, we have the forgiveness of sins. We're believing children of God. We're heirs of heaven. And of course, what this also tells us is that what Jesus can also do is he can look in the hearts of those who have rejected him, those who don't believe and who therefore will be facing eternal condemnation. But see, Jesus is admirably equipped. He knows who are his, those who are his, and he knows those who are not. Isaiah said, Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Righteousness and faithfulness, that's what makes Christ our king who he is and what he's all about and his righteousness well that's his holiness his perfection his ability well especially thinking about while he was here on this earth to perfectly keep the law of God and be able to give us his perfection his holiness so that we'll be ready we are ready for eternal life in heaven, to be taken to those mansions of heaven. And his faithfulness, his faithfulness means that we don't ever have to wonder if he'd ever renege on his promise to be gracious and merciful to us and to take us who by the grace of God believe in him to eternal life in heaven. We don't ever have to fear him saying, no, I'm not going to do it because he's faithful. He's faithful to his promises. Well, I said he's admirably equipped to be our savior, our judge, our king. When we think about the work that Jesus does, well, in, in catechism class and, and in Bible information classes, I'll often talk about the threefold office into which our Savior was installed when the Spirit of the Lord descended on him in that form of a dove. And when he was installed into his office, he was installed as our great prophet, priest, and king. And he's our great prophet because, well, he's a greater prophet than Isaiah was, of course. Isaiah, a great prophet, but... Jesus a greater prophet because Jesus preached about himself as being the savior of the world. He's our great priest because he didn't have to make any sacrifices for himself because he was sinless. But he made that one great sacrifice on the altar of the cross and that that one sacrifice, once for all, he paid for all sins and won for us and for all the forgiveness of sins that we need for heaven. 
And he's our great king because he didn't lead an army into battle against Satan and sin. No, he single-handedly fought that battle and won the victory, decisively defeating the devil, death, sin, hell, so that our sins are paid for and heaven is our home. See, there's no better king. A king who's a king well, now in our hearts and, and forever in heaven. Well, the consequence then that we could say of our Advent King coming into our world is a kingdom in which peace prevails as it did back in the Garden of Eden before the fall into sin. Isaiah said, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion, and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them, the cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. And now when Isaiah is talking there, it's obvious that he's talking about heaven. It's obvious he's talking about heaven where everything will be absolutely perfect forever. Don't we absolutely long to be in that perfect place where there will be no more sickness, sorrow, or pain? Where no, no COVID, nothing like that ever again. Wouldn't it be great if Christ our King would come right now and say, now's the time to come. Isaiah says, in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. But until he comes, as we still continue to live in this sinful world, what we can still do is we can rejoice that through faith there is that wonderful peace in our hearts, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding because we have the forgiveness of all of our sins and we're going to be a part of that eternal righteous kingdom that he has established for us with his victory on the cross. We can look forward to being in that perfect place forever because of Jesus, because of our Advent King. Oh, there's this fable in which the story goes that this young boy's sister was dying. And this boy, he had heard somehow that if he were able to get a leaf from the tree of life and give that to her, that she'd be healed. And so in the fable, remember it's a fable, he went to the gates of heaven, talked to an angel, and asked for a leaf from the tree of life. And, well, the angel heard his request, but then the angel said to him, well, remember that that doesn't mean that she wouldn't be facing death in the future, that she wouldn't have life's trials and troubles and aches and pains to go through that most likely those things would be a part of her life in the future if she did get better then and did end up living. But then what happened is that the angel did allow the young boy to get a little bit of a glimpse of heaven. And when he got that glimpse of heaven, he could hardly believe his eyes. And then he kind of changed tune a little bit and instead of asking for that leaf, he said to the angel, forget the leaf, may I come in with her. And because Christ our King came, 
because of what he did for us. Isn't it great for us to know that we can have that same eager anticipation? And, well, right now, knowing his grace and love, we're so blessed now. And there's so much better lying ahead. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith today with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. We pray through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. several people to include in our prayers today. We'll pray for Todd Hubert. He had neck surgery, removing a disc in his neck and putting in an appliance or something, I guess is what they called it. Surgery went quite well, I'm told. Don Janicki, we pray for him. He did experience a stroke and, well, he is in rehab at Diamonddale right now. We pray for Paula Burris. She had some extensive heart testing going on this past week. And, well, we'll also pray for my dad as we think about him. He's, he's in his own home right now trying to adapt to that, being back there. But let's pray. Lord God, as we think of the different trials and troubles that these members of our extended church family are dealing with, and as we think of others who are listed in our prayer list, we say, Lord God, please keep on sending the Holy Spirit to them, build them up, strengthen them in their faith, Give them the strength and the hope that only you can give to, to deal with their problems and troubles in this life. According to your will, if it is according to your will, grant them healing. But especially keep on building them up and making them stronger in your grace and love. And we gather up all of the prayers we have today as we join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's join in singing our prayer for our country. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Again, thank you for joining me for worship today. Just a couple of announcements in the congregation. Well, Jessica Comer has a birthday on Sunday, Saturday. Nina Olson, Melissa Hawkins have birthdays. Wednesday, we have our second midweek Advent service. I'll be here for the service. And well, at 5.30, we have our soup supper ahead of time. And 6.30, the service will be looking again at heavenly messages from heavenly messengers. And we're looking at the heavenly message to Mary on Wednesday night. Thursday night at 6.30, we do have a church council meeting. And I, let's see, I've told you about some of the people in our congregation and our prayer list. Please keep all of the members in our church family in your, in your prayers. The Lord bless and keep you. Always, amen.